Good morning. Welcome to Bible study. I'll pray and we shall begin. Father, we do thank you and we praise you for the opportunity that we have to get into your word. And we thank you, Father, that you're present with us while it happens because you have given us your spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth, to be our counsel, our guide, to make the scriptures come alive to us. So Holy Spirit, as you always do, think through my mind, speak through my lips, the illumination of the revelation of God. And may you see to it that the word goes forth with clarity, unhindered and unchecked by any unseen or opposing forces, because those forces have been rendered ineffective, defeated as a result of the finished work of Christ at Calvary. And it's in that finished work that we do rest, for we have entered into your rest, Father. And there we remain and where we remain is everything we need that pertains to life and godliness, experiencing your shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken, walking in the fullness of your blessing. So I thank you that we have access to your peace and that we don't have to be anxious or careful for anything. But in prayer and supplication, we can make our requests known to you and your peace that surpasses all understanding, your peace that we cannot express or articulate, your peace present in the midst of our storms, that which surpasses our understanding will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I thank you that we can cast every care on you because you care so much for us. And that we don't have to worry about our lives, for you are Jehovah Shalom, our peace. And all our need is met according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus, because you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. And you sent your word and healed us. He took our infirmities, bore our sicknesses, and by his stripes we were healed. Past tense, it is a done deal. It is finished, settled according to your word, Father. As you look at us through your son, you see a healed, victorious, and triumphant people, because you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. So I thank you this day that the hearts are prepared, the ground is ready, the soil is rich, the seed of the word will be planted into the hearts of those watching and listening, and there will be a harvest of that word in their hearts, visibly seen in their lives in the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Let's make our way to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, we are going to continue on with our uh, lesson on Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, his epistle to the Corinthian church. And so we completed chapter 11 last week. Let's take a look now at chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, which reads, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, now concerning these things, spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Paul says that he wants us to have knowledge, information, specifically, of course, the Corinthian believers here. But he wants them, the bottom line, is to have information, to have, to have appropriate and, and correct knowledge so that it can be rightly applied. He wants them to be in the know. He wants us to be in the know. So he says, I don't want you to be ignorant regarding what? Spiritual gifts. Verse 2, you know that you were Gentiles, what kind of Gentiles? In the natural, they're still Gentiles. Of course, in Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile. But they were Gentiles easily carried away to these what? Paul says, dumb idols. Dumb idols. Voiceless, without speech, without significance. This is what he means when he says dumb idols. As a matter of fact, in chapter 8, Paul lets us know that in reality, there are no other gods. And that these idols are lifeless. Now, we note that there are celestials masquerading as entities that have been worshipped and are still worshipped today, even if the groups of people that worship them are smaller than what they were before during antiquity. But nevertheless, we know that Israel had to be placed in check by God for worshipping the host of heaven. And that host would fall under the jurisdiction of the adversary and the third that he influenced to follow him during his insurrection. So ultimately those are the gods that were worshipped. Demons later on would uh, produce the images that these Gentile nations would build, carve and, and, and fashion, and of course they would worship them. But what's Paul saying here? They were dumb, lifeless, voiceless. He says, however you were led. Verse 3, therefore I make known to you. 
he's about to show a difference between dumb idols and the ever-living God. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. If you're speaking by the Holy Spirit, you cannot call Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. No one speaking by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, calls Jesus a curse. If they call Jesus a curse, that's not by the Spirit of God. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. If someone is authentically saying that Jesus is Lord, well, that's by way of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Verse 4, diversities of gifts, same spirit. Now, how come in verse 5 and in verse 6, it also mentions differences in diversities, but it doesn't read same spirit? As a matter of fact, verse 5 reads same Lord, verse 6 reads same God. Spirit, Lord, God, what's Paul talking about here? Well, verse 4 is specifically talking about what he's going to mention in just a few verses, the gifts of the Spirit. As a matter of fact, he mentioned them in verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, or now concerning spiritual brethren. So verse 4 is about the gifts of the Spirit, diversities of gifts, same Spirit. Verse 5, differences of ministries but the same Lord. This is referring to what? Ephesians 4.11, the gifts of the Son. This word uh, ministries can also read administrations. There are differences of administrations there are differences of ministries but the same lord gifts of the spirit ephesians 4 11 and then it reads in verse 6 and there are diff diversities of activities the word also means operations there are diversities of activities or operations but it is the same god who works all in all this is a reference to romans 12 6 through 8 so verse 4 is about the gifts of the spirit totaling nine. Verse five is about the gifts of the Lord, totaling five, the Messiah. And verse seven, the gifts of the Father, found in Romans 12, six through eight, totaling or numbering seven. Five gifts of the Lord, two more to the Father, two more to the Spirit. That's not a coincidence. That was intentional. Verse 7, it says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom. These are the gifts of the Spirit Paul is getting ready to mention. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles by the same Spirit, to another prophecy by the same Spirit, to another discerning of spirits by the same Spirit, to another different kinds of tongues by the same Spirit, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Let's look at these again, and let's take our time with them. Verse 8, the gifts of the Spirit, the diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit mentioned in verse 4. For to one is given the word of wisdom. What is a word of wisdom? That is a look into the mind of God about a future thing. An example would be when Paul said, may not perceive this journey will end in disaster. And shortly after it did. And he was shipwrecked at Malta. Acts 27. 
to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit. What's the difference between a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge? While the word of wisdom speaks to something future, the word of knowledge speaks to something past and present. A great example of this would be Acts chapter 5 when Peter said, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, speaking to Ananias and Sapphira? How did Peter know that? The lie had already happened, so how did Peter know? Only by way of the Holy Spirit. The difference between a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. One, future wisdom. The other, knowledge, past and present. Now, what gift is next? Faith. To another, faith by the same spirit. What faith is this talking about? I mean, the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible says the just, the declared righteous, live by faith. That is every single person in the body of Christ. Every single person that calls themselves a believer in the Lord. Those who have confessed the Lord and believed in their heart that God has raised them from the dead. They all, we all, live by faith. Now, Verse 11 tells us that it's one spirit that works all these things. And the one spirit, who is the Holy Spirit, distributes these nine gifts to each one individually as he wills. So that means that this faith could not be the same faith to just live by. This faith could not be the same faith that we walk by. This could not be the same faith in which we were dealt the measure of. It couldn't be because this faith only manifests as the Spirit wills. The faith that the just live by is 24-7 faith. So what is this faith? Oh, this faith that is the gift of the Spirit is the faith that goes beyond our faith. I, I, I would call it supernatural faith, but faith already is supernatural. But this is a step beyond that. A great example of this would be uh, when Paul... Uh, encountering the sorcerer Elemis said and now a dark mist will cover your eyes and in a, in, a, in a moment this false prophet this sorcerer Elemis walked around blind for a while we could even say because gifts work together, we could even say that when Peter encountered the lame man at the beautiful gate, he stepped out of his faith, received its salvation, into the faith of the Holy Spirit to speak to that man, to tell a man who had been lame from his mother's womb to get up and walk. That's what this kind of faith is. So it's not the same as Romans 1.17 or 2 Corinthians 5.7 or Romans 12.3. No, this is the gift of the Spirit, faith, that only manifests as the Spirit wills. One of my instructors in school of ministry said, this faith picks up where yours leaves off. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Gifts of healing. How does this differ from petitioning God for healing? How does this differ from doing a work in the name of Jesus? You know, John 14, verses 13 and 14, or verses 12 through 14, that we would do greater works in his name. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Uh, petitioning the Father, Mark eleven twenty four. 24, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you'll have them. Going to the Father and petitioning him, for your healing of some kind of condition. How do those differ from this? Because this only manifests as the Spirit of God wills. This is a healing that is immediate. The moment you say, in the name of Jesus, rise up, be healed, the healing manifests. There, 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 is, there are no emissaries of the adversary pushing against this. They can't. So that's the thing about the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are immediate and precise. Very specific. To another, the working 
of miracles. As a matter of fact, the, the man at the gate beautiful, most likely that was all three of these working hand in hand. It was an act of faith beyond the faith of Peter because he spoke. Led of the Holy Spirit to do so, expecting the man to get up. The man received his healing immediately. He got up and walked. But what kind of healing was it? Well, according to Acts 4, it was a miracle of healing. So it was a healing miracle, which means there's a difference between a healing and a healing miracle because this next gift, the working of miracles, miracles has to do, or miracles have to do with temporary suspension to the laws of nature. Okay, how about Philip when he baptized the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8? He fully immersed the eunuch in water. When the eunuch came up out of the water, Philip was gone. He disappeared. How can that be? How is that possible? The Bible says the Holy Spirit snatched him, caught him away so that he was found in Azotus. How is that possible? Well, it's not possible. It's impossible. But what's impossible to God? It was a miracle. It was a miraculous thing. And, of course, the man who received his healing at the Gate Beautiful, that was a miracle of healing, a specific kind of miracle. That was a healing miracle, whereas Philip being caught away was not a healing miracle. It was a different type of miracle. And, of course, how many miracles were worked through our Messiah in his earthly ministry, during his earthly ministry? To walk on water is a miracle. It's a temporary suspension of a law of nature. Because the Bible says that... Uh, that, that he walked through the midst of them at the edge of a cliff, their intent for him to fall off to his death, but he walked through the midst of them. That's a miracle. They took up stones to stone him, but he was nowhere to be found. That's a miracle. And we see these miracles also worked through the hands of the apostles during the Acts church. Verse 10 to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy. Holy Spirit specific prophecy. How does this differ from Romans 12? Prophecy is mentioned in the gifts of the Father, the diversities of activities or diversities of operations. Romans 12, 6. If prophecy, let him prophesy in proportion to his faith. Oh, according to his spirit. So Romans 12, 6 prophecy is the prophecy that comes out of my spirit. Whereas this prophecy comes by way of the Holy Spirit. It's going to be more accurate. It's going to be more precise. Oftentimes we would see Paul operate like this during the time of the Acts church when he would arrest the attention of the crowd, men of Israel, and you who fear God. The spirit or the prophecy that manifests by way of the Holy Spirit does exactly what 1 Corinthians 14 says. Edifies, exhorts, and comforts. But the specificity is unlike that which goes forth when it comes out of your own spirit according to Romans 12, 6. That's more general. It's a good, inspiring word. But it's not specifically addressing something. Why? Because how could you, based on your own intellect and out of your own soul and mind, know anything about what's going on in someone else's life behind their closed doors, in their prayer closet? You can't know that, but the Holy Spirit does. So when the Holy Spirit uses you in the gift of prophecy, he's going to address through you things that there's no way you could know on your own. That's the gift of prophecy. Then it says, to another, discerning of spirits. Now, we all have discernment. We don't all use it, unfortunately, but we all have it. Some, it seems, it, it seems they have more than others. There just may be a sensitivity. As a matter of fact, there are those that have a sensitivity to the spirit world. They're, they're more sensitive than others are. Um... And so, it, and so in that, their, their discernment radar may be, their antenna may, may be uh, utilized more, might be sharper. 
But in a general sense, all believers have a, a measure of discernment. But what is this talking about? This is not just talking about sensing what's going on in the life of a believer. Sensing by, by faith or by, by your spirit a potential opposing spirit harassing your fellow brother. Whereas the gift of discerning of spirits allows you to go beyond that. You're going to see some stuff. Uh, Peter experienced this when he fell into a trance. He saw a sheet from heaven. Uh, Stephen also experienced this. He looked into heaven. He saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. I mean, it was a prophetic word of wisdom discerning of spirits encounter uh, or, or manifestation that Stephen experienced. Right? You're seeing angels. You're seeing demons. That's discerning of spirits. You're sensing angels, you're sensing demons, that's discernment. And then to another, different kinds of tongues. Different kinds of tongues. Unfortunately, even today, believers get this mixed up with praying in the Spirit. And so they believe. See, based on verse 11, everyone doesn't pray in the Spirit. As a matter of fact, the end of the chapter would have it seem that not everyone praise in the spirit but this is not talking about praying in the spirit this is talking about the gift of the spirit known as different kinds of tongues you 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 don't you don't see this in operation in in the book of acts not the gift i'm sure it happened but everywhere that that praying in the spirit is mentioned acts 2 acts 10 acts 19 it was the result of someone being filled with the spirit and then the initial evidence that they were filled manifested. They began to pray in the Spirit as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's not different kinds of tongues. Different kinds of tongues is for a specific purpose. It's only for the public setting. And it must be accompanied by what? The following gift, the interpretation of tongues. So that, a, that in a public setting, everyone hearing can be edified. According to 1 Corinthians 14, Different kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues are equal to prophecy. Paul says, I wish you all would prophesy more than you spoke with tongues unless there is interpretation following the different kinds of tongues. Because that's the thing about the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are for what and for who. They are for all and for the profit of all. The gifts of the Spirit are not for you. That's why none of us own them. We don't possess them. I don't have the working of miracles. And, and there may be a ministry gift or ministry gifts in which the working of miracles manifests through them frequently. They do not have it though. They do not own it. I don't own miracles. I don't own gifts of healing. I don't own this faith. I have the measure of faith that I'm supposed to develop, but I don't have this faith. It could be manifested through me. It could be manifested through a spirit-filled believer, but I don't have it. I don't have word of knowledge. I don't have word of wisdom. I don't have different kinds of tongues. I can pray in the spirit. That's my heavenly language. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. You, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. But this, this is the gift of the spirit. Different kinds of tongues. I don't have this. I don't have interpretation of tongues. All of these gifts are for the profit or edification of others. They manifest in a setting where others can benefit. Verse 11 confirms what? We don't own them. We don't have them. Who do we have? We have the Holy Spirit. He has the nine gifts. What does he do? He works all these things and he distributes to each one individually as he wills. Oh, well, if the Holy Spirit is God, then the gifts of the Spirit only manifest when God wills for them to manifest. You got to know the difference between, between by his stripes we were healed and gifts of healing. See, see, the, the new covenant speaks of our healing that we have a covenant right to. But there's no covenant right to the gifts of the Spirit, not a covenant right. Now, we have the Holy Spirit, and the Bible even tells us at the end of this chapter, as well as in chapter 14, to desire them, covet them. More specifically, covet earnestly the best gifts of the Spirit to be in operation for any given setting. 
I don't want the gifts that I like the sound of the most to manifest. I want the best gifts for whatever setting, whatever context I find myself in. One of or, or one or more of the nine gifts should manifest in any kind of setting that's most fitting. That's what we're coveting. That's what we're desiring. But there, there's no covenant promise of these nine gifts. They're as the Lord wills. The promise of the Holy Spirit we have. We have Him. If we ask to be filled with Him by faith, we'll be filled. We have that right. We have that promise. But what He works, these nine gifts, we don't have the promise of any of these. He distributes and He works them as He wills. So gifts of healing, that's as He wills. That'll manifest when God desires that to manifest. But believing God for our healing? Yeah, we have the covenant right to that. If we pray according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Messiah went about healing all those who were sick and oppressed of the devil. Sounds to me like healing from sickness and disease. Freedom from infirmities and oppression by way of Satan is the will of God. So, so I, can, I, can, I can speak to a mountain. If there's no doubt in my heart, it'll move. That's not gifts of healing. Gifts of healing, that manifests as the Spirit wills. These nine gifts, they manifest as the Spirit wills. He owns them. We have him as he wills. They will manifest. Now let's look at one more thing regarding these gifts. Let's look at the order in which they're listed. Because over time, scholars, those who believe in the charismata, that is, they have recognized that these nine gifts can be broken down into three categories. Three gifts per category. And almost... Not quite, but almost they were listed in proper order and category. The reason why they weren't is because God's intentional about what he's doing. So let's go back to verse 8. It says, for to one is given the word of wisdom and then one is given the word of knowledge. The word of wisdom and the word of knowledge are considered revelation gifts. Right? So a word of wisdom or word of knowledge may not always be words coming out of your mouth. A word of knowledge or a word of wisdom could come by way of dream or vision. Uh, you may articulate it later by way of words. But a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom doesn't necessarily mean a word spoken. It's something received. So these are revelation gifts. Now there's one more gift that will go into this category, yet it's not listed with them. And there's a specific reason why. I'll keep reading. Then it says faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles. Those three are together. They're in the same category. They've been recognized as the power gifts. These are the gifts that do. right? The signs, the wonders, the demonstration of power. That's these three right here. Faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles power gifts, right? But then what do we read next? We read prophecy, then dis discerning of spirits, then interpretation of tongues, as well as different kinds of tongues. Now, discerning of spirits is right there in the middle of both prophecy, different kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Prophecy, different kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues have been recognized as the vocal gifts. The vocal gifts. These are the gifts spoken. Prophecy edifies, exhorts, comforts, different kinds of tongues with the companion gift, interpretation of tongues. The two work together. They cannot work separately. They equal to prophecy. Therefore, they edify, exhort, and comfort. 1 Corinthians 14 will explain all of this in more detail. But discerning of spirits is right there. Discerning of spirits is a revelation gift. It's over there with word of knowledge and word of wisdom. But I believe that it's placed here intentionally. Why? Because discernment is needed for vocal gifts. How can you know the difference between 
the gift of prophecy that is according to your faith and the gift of prophecy that's according to the Holy Spirit. How do you know the difference between different kinds of tongues, which is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit and you simply praying in the Spirit? Discernment, discernment would be needed, and I believe that's why it's placed here. But these nine gifts over time have been placed into three categories. Does the Bible say this? No. It's just observation by scholars and teachers and ministry gifts. That the revelation gifts are word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits. Vocal gifts are prophecy, interpretation of tongues and different kinds of tongues. And then power gifts would be faith, gifts of healings, and working of miracles. All nine of these gifts can manifest through any spirit-filled believer as the Holy Spirit wills, specifically those coveting earnestly the gift, the, the best gifts of the Spirit being in operation. Let's keep reading. Verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members. This is a a, a unique direction Paul goes between chapters 12 and chapter chapters 12 and 14 because he's talking about these gifts but now he's about to talk about the body very similar to Ephesians 4 11 through 16 he says for as the body is one and has many members but all the members of that one body being many are one body so also is Christ let's make sure you don't miss that the body is one but it has many members. Think of your human body. One body, many members. It says, but all the members of that one body, being many, many as in members, are one body. Well, so also is Christ. Oh, works the same way. So the body of Christ is one, but it has many members. There's, there's diversity and oneness simultaneously in both the human body and the body of Christ. The heart does not do what the brain does. The kidneys don't do what the lungs do. Diverse members, but they all make up one body. Verse 13, for by one spirit we were what? We were baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Verse 13 again, for by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, we have been baptized into one body. So when we hear the preacher preach the message of salvation and faith comes and we respond in faith to what came by faith and we get born again, what happens? What happens in the spirit realm? This is what we can't see in the natural realm. The Holy Spirit then takes us. All right, the, 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 the truest part of us, the part that does not need a body to be us, only needs a body to live here on earth. Our spirits are taken by the Holy Spirit and fully immersed into Christ. We are baptized into the body of Christ. This is the baptism that the unbeliever experiences. There are three baptisms that we see in Scripture. The baptism into salvation, the baptism into the body of Christ. Then we see the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And then we see a baptism in water, fully immersed in water. But baptism is, is immersion. Not sprinkling, not, not uh, you partially getting wet or touched by the water. No, it's full immersion. I mean, there clearly isn't a, a right order because we see uh, uh, water baptism and being baptized with the Holy Spirit. We, we see those received by one in different orders and acts. Some would say it has to be a certain order or, or you're not saved. That's not true because we don't see that happen all throughout the book of Acts. Now, could there be an ideal one? Sure, let's look at our Messiah. Our Messiah was the Messiah who was then immersed in water and then baptized with the Holy Spirit. But that, that, that doesn't happen in that order all the time salvation has to happen first but the other two it could be either or we see that in acts 10 we see that in acts 19 
It's not the same every time. This, verse 13, has to happen first. An unbeliever must be fully immersed in the body of Christ. Once that happens, water baptism or being baptized with the Holy Spirit can occur in any order. They both should occur, but they are not needed to be saved. What's needed to be saved is, is confession of the mouth that Messiah is Lord and that belief in the heart that God's raised him from the dead, and you'll be saved. One does not need to be baptized in water to be saved. One does not need to be filled with the Spirit to be saved. But saved folk should be baptized in water and should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Water baptism is the outward expression of the inward change and conversion. Being baptized with the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit is the only way a believer is qualified to be a witness for the King. So they should happen. But they are not necessary for salvation. I'm going to make sure that we understand these things. So for by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, we were what? Baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. One body, many members. And the human body clearly has to work together has to work together for proper function. Verse 15, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Imagine, imagine your, your, your members, the members of your body, having ought with one another and not seeing eye to eye. How would the human body function? It would be a problem. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Just because the foot said that, just because the ear said that, would that mean they're not of the body? Absolutely not. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were hearing or an ear, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And he does the same thing with the body of Christ. All right, so, so, so each member of our anatomy, our human body, has a function and is needed. Now, now praise God, these machines were so wonderfully and fearfully made that if certain parts were removed, the body could still function. In some cases, it could still function at a peak level. In some cases, uh, it may not function at peak performance, but it can still function. That's how awesome the body is. But not maximum level with the body being on one accord. And so the body of Christ today is, is working to a measure, to a degree, but not at maximum capacity. Verse 18 again, But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? If the whole body were the ear, where would the body be? Because the whole body can't be in here. That would just be a big ear. Where would the body be? The question is asked. But now indeed there are members, yet one body. Once again, many members, one body. And the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. I can't say that because the eye can't do what the hand can do. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, the head can't say that. Verse 22, no, much rather, pay attention to these next two verses. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker, they're necessary. What did Paul just say? This is applicable to the human body and the body of Christ. He said that those members of the body which seem to be weaker, he didn't say those members of the body which are weaker are necessary. He said those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And this is what happens in the body of Christ. This is why certain believers won't get involved in the work of the Lord or the work of ministry because they look at other individuals seemingly doing greater works 
or larger works or more influential works and they think, well, I must not be needed. But Paul says that which seems to be weaker, once again, not that which is weaker, but that which seems to be weaker, it's actually necessary. It's necessary. If you look at certain figures or works in the body of Christ, you need to understand that those works cannot happen without the parts that seem to be weaker. Those parts that seem to be weaker are necessary. Look at verse 23. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable. The Bible didn't say that they were less honorable. The Bible says we think them to be. We do that. Humans, we do that. With our ways, our idiosyncrasies, our issues. We bestow less honor on parts. We think certain parts are weaker. But the Bible says, "Uh uh-uh. No, the Bible doesn't say that they're weaker. The Bible doesn't say that they're less honorable. As a matter of fact, look at what verse 23 says. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we actually bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. The presentable parts don't need that. The, the, let, let's use the, the gifts of the Son for, uh, as an example. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. What's Paul saying? They actually don't need any recognition. But notice that, that a Paul the Apostle recognized a servant by the name of Phoebe and said, as she was a help to me, you be a help to her. What did Paul do? Paul, a very obvious part of the body, which actually doesn't need any more honor than what automatically comes with it, bestowed greater honor on the servant Phoebe. No, no, our presentable parts have no need. But but God composed the body, verse 24, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it, which produces the unity in the body. Verse 25, why? So that this happens. Remember 1 Corinthians 11. That there should be no schism in the body. No rent. No dissension. Seditions and heresies and factions. No sectarianism. There should be no schism in the body. But that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So the body of Christ is suffering in the earth. Because when one suffers, we all suffer. But, he says, if one is honored, all the members, all the members should, unfortunately all the members don't, but all the members should rejoice with it. Verse 27. Now look at what he says next. He says, now you are the body of Christ. He says, and your members individually. You are the body of Christ and members individually. He's very clear about this. To segue to another identity supposed to have been given to the church, which is the bride of Christ. And the majority of the church believes that the church is the bride of Christ. And yet there's no scripture as clear as this, which recognizes the body of Christ as the bride of Christ. That's another conversation. I I just want to observe how clear Paul is here. Now you are the body of Christ. We don't have to, we don't need interpretation for this. It's as clear as day. He says in your members individually. We are members individually contained in this one body. Diversity and unity working hand in hand. Now, a lot of confusion comes out of verses 28 through 30. And I, I, don't, I don't know why. Well, I do know why. But if people would take the time to... And I'm going to say, I'm, 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 I'm going to put the blame on ministry gifts, especially teachers, those who have been instructed to equip saints, to educate saints. Why is there still confusion in 2022 regarding the, the gifts of the Father... Diversities of activities, verse 6. The gifts of the Son, differences of ministries, verse 5. And the gifts of the Spirit, diversities of gifts, verse 4. 
you can't you can't you can't get the gifts of the spirit mixed up with the gifts of the son and the gifts of the son mixed up with the gifts of the father you can't afford to mix them up otherwise you'll have confusion regarding these next three verses and let's take a look at them and God has what he's appointed these in the church now the first thing that we want to establish is that this is not a hierarchy family some have assumed that uh, the apostle is the king of the ministry gifts. And that's why there are so many that view their, their movement from one gift to the next. They see it as an elevation. It's not an elevation. It's a transition. You don't elevate from pastor to apostle. That's not an elevation. If it were, then Peter took a demotion in the body of Christ because he began as an apostle and later on was identified as an elder, a pastor. It's simply a transition. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting that we seem to think that you're supposed to start as a pastor and then later on become an apostle. But didn't the 12 apostles start off as uh, apostles? And then later on, they became pastors. The gifts of the son, it's, 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 not a, it's not a pecking order. It's not a hierarchy. It's a transition. When we read this word appointed, this simply means what God or who God ordained first for the purpose of the spreading of the message of the kingdom. I'll show it to you right now. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, gift of the son. Second prophets, gift of the son. Third teachers, gift of the son. After that, miracles. Wait a minute. Where's the evangelist and where's the pastor? Shouldn't it read fourth and fifth? Because Ephesians 4, 11 highlights five specific gifts and the order in which they're listed is apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Teachers are fifth in that list. How come teachers are third in that list, in this list? That alone lets you know this is not a hierarchy. If it is, Paul is confusing himself as well as the believers at Corinth and the believers at Ephesus. So it's not a hierarchy. There is a, there is a reason that they are listed in the order they're listed in here in 1 Corinthians 12, as opposed to Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4, they're listed. But in Ephesians, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, they are listed in order of their appointment, of their appointing. He appointed first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, for whatever reason, it switches from the gifts of the Son to the gifts of the Spirit. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, then varieties of tongues. What, what's going on here? Well, well, a few things are happening here. Number one, Paul is establishing what God appointed or who God appointed first. Appointed for what purpose? the spreading of the message of the kingdom. And the second thing that, that he does is he, he specifically mentions three gifts of the Son, intentionally leaves out two, but includes the two by the gifts of the Spirit that should frequently manifest in those gifts. So in other words, we can read it this way. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, fourth evangelists, fifth pastors. Why? Because miracles and gifts of healings are gifts that are frequently seen in the office of evangelists, while helps and administrations are gifts frequently seen in the office of pastor. Why does it go in this order? Because this is what God is saying by way of Paul in the 12th chapter of the first epistle to the Corinthian church. He's saying what? God has appointed these in the church. First, he appointed apostles, the apostles of the Lamb. Paul the apostle. Why did he appoint them first? Because apostles are delegates. They are sent to ones. They are messengers. So he had to appoint messengers first so that they could spread the message. Who did he appoint second? 
He appointed prophets second because what do prophets to do? Not only do prophets foretell, not only do prophets edify, prophets confirm. So the prophets were appointed second after the apostles to confirm the message that the sent one spoke. He appointed teachers next for what purpose? To open up the eyes of the understanding of believers regarding the confirmed sent word. Then he appointed the evangelists to spread the message of salvation so that souls could enter into the family and become a part of the flock of God. And then he lastly appointed pastors to do what? Shepherd the sheep. Shepherd the flock. This is an order of appointment, not order of hierarchy. Because if that's the case, the pastor is mentioned last here. In Ephesians 4, the teacher was mentioned last. If this is a hierarchy, that means the other four gifts can tell pastors what to do at any given time. And the only person I report to is Jesus. Now, do I have advisors? I sure do. Mentors? Absolutely. A spiritual father who's in the presence of the Lord now? Yep. But as far as the assignment given to me, placed here, whatever Crenshaw Christian Center is to do by way of me standing in the position that I'm standing in, those instructions are going to have to come from the head of the church. So this is not a hierarchy. Can't no random apostle come in here and try to point at this scripture and say, well, you need to listen to what I'm saying, Pastor Fred, because, you know, he appointed apostles first. No, 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 that's not what that means. He, not, he did not appoint them in order of rule. He appointed them first because apostles are ambassadors. They are the carriers of the message of the kingdom, and they went forth first. The apostles of the Lamb, Paul, Barnabas, James, the brother of Jesus, Timothy, Titus, Silas, they were sent. And the prophets confirmed that sent word. The teachers expounded on that confirmed sent word. The evangelists brought the sheep in to be exposed to that taught, confirmed, sent word. And the pastor shepherded the flock. Now, we get to verse 29, and questions are asked. And I'm telling you right now, the questions or the answers to these questions can't be a mix of yes and no. They're either all no's or they're all yeses. The reason why people think they're a mix is because they don't know how to properly categorize the gifts of the Spirit, Son, and Father. So let's go through these questions and let's answer them. Are all apostles? No. Are all apostles? No, because he's only given some to be. Doesn't Ephesians 4.11 say he's given some to be, not all to be? So that's an easy one, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say? That the first question is an easy answer. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Because he's only given some to be prophets. Now, if the question was, are all kings? The answer is yes. Are all lords? The answer is yes. Are all priests? The answer is yes. But, but those, aren't, those aren't gifts. That's what he's made us to be. He's made us to be kings, lords, and priests, those whom he's washed in his blood. But, but these, these administrations, these governmental gifts, these first three mentioned here, no, all aren't because he's only given some to be. So are all apostles? No, only some are. Are all prophets? No, only some are. Are all teachers? No, only some are. Are all workers of miracles? We can ask two questions here. First, are all evangelists? No. And secondly, do all have the gift of the working of miracles manifested or manifesting through them? No. Are they positioned to have the gift working through them? Yes. But do they all have the gift working through them? No. Therefore, they're not all workers of miracles. Do all have gifts of healing? No one has gifts of healing. 
But does the gift of the Spirit, known as gifts of healing, work through all? It can work through all, but it doesn't, because it's as the Spirit wills. Therefore, no, all are not workers of miracles, and once again, all are not evangelists. And then here's where people get confused. Do all speak with tongues? I mean, I remember being in school and ministry, and students would yell out, well, they should. This is not something I'm praying in the Spirit. Do all and should all believers pray in the Spirit? Yeah. If you've been filled with the Spirit, you've been given a heavenly language that will only be heard when you speak. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak for you. He just gives you the utterance. You have to do the speaking. That's praying in the Spirit. All right, that's Acts chapter 2. As a matter of fact, Acts 2, what happened in Acts 2 has never happened before or has never happened again. That was unique. That was the coming. That was the day of Pentecost being completed. That's what it means when, when we read in the scripture. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. Holy day fulfilled. The day of Pentecost had fully come. They were filled with the Spirit. What's the first thing that happened when they were filled with the Spirit? They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But then a miracle accompanied what happened when they were speaking with tongues. They began to speak in the languages of other nations. And there were also cloven tongues of fire. You, you, listen, you haven't seen cloven tongues of fire in the Bible again after Acts 2. As a matter of fact, the next time you see cloven tongues of fire is in a blasphemous, a blasphemous way in the Bone Thugs and Harmony video, first of the month. Go back and check it out, and you'll see cloven tongues of fire. How ironic that there were tongues of fire above the heads of rappers that when they rap sound like they're speaking with other tongues. But you don't see that stuff in the Bible again. But you do see people praying in the Spirit. Acts 10, the Holy Spirit fell on them. They prayed in the Spirit. Acts 19, they were filled with the Spirit. They prayed in the Spirit. That's Jude 20. That's 1 Corinthians 14, 4. What this is talking about, do all speak with tongues? No, all are not used in this gift. Do all interpret? No, all are not used in that gift. Just like all aren't used in the other seven gifts. That's what Paul is talking about right here. Verse 31. He says, what? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is life and truth. It will not, it cannot return to you void, but it will accomplish that which is set out to do. It will prosper in that for which it was sent. And I thank you indeed. The seed of the word has been sent. The seed of the word is incorruptible. So the incorruptible seed of the word that be, Father, that accomplishes where you send it and prospers where you send it, well, that has gone forth. And we declared early on that the hearts of those watching and listening were hearts of good ground. So the seed that has been sown will produce in their hearts the harvest visibly seen in their lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for making the two invitations I'll mention in just a moment available to those watching and listening. If you're not a part of the kingdom of God, you can be right now a part of the kingdom of God, the family of God. It begins with a verbal declaration, acknowledgement, and, and, a, and a belief in your heart corresponding. Repeat after me saying, dear God, you said in your word, if I would confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, I would be saved. You say, whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Well, on this day, I first repent of my sinful ways and confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that he is Lord that he took away the sin of the world and that you raised him from the dead. I'm now a part of his church, his body, his family, his kingdom. He is my head, my Savior and Lord. I am your child. You are my father, and I'll serve you all the days of my life. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. To be filled with the Spirit, simply repeat after me, saying, Heavenly Father, I see in your word the early church, the first disciples. They did not go forth preaching the gospel until they received power from heaven. 
they were filled with the Spirit, they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Like them on that day, by faith, I received the gift of the Spirit. I'm now filled with the Spirit. I, too, have received my heavenly language. And most importantly, I'm now a witness for the King and for the kingdom. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. If you've prayed these prayers for the very first time, either or both, praise God, you're in the family of God and you're filled with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. You now may wonder what is next. If you have a question or questions about that, you can reach out to us by way of email, that address on the screen before you. Hallelujah. And now it's time to give. It's time to sow. Cheerfully, that's how we do it. Knowing that when we sow, there is a harvest. Now, your primary reason for sowing should be about furthering the kingdom. Yet, you can be excited about the harvest. Because whatever one sows, so shall that one reap. The measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. That's why Paul says, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. But know that as long as the earth remains, seed time harvest. And we will reap in due season if we faint not and do not lose heart. There are many ways that you can give. You all know these ways. You can text to give on your smart devices or go to our website, faithdome.org, by way of our app. Uh, you can call the ministry locally or our 24-hour call center. You can give by way of cash. There's our tag on the screen. Or by way of Alexa devices. So if you're ready to give... Let's lift our gifts up to our great high priest, the Lord Jesus. He'll take them. Worship the Father on our behalf. I'll pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word on giving. Father, we thank you that you consider us your fellow workers, the laborers that are to be sent into the plentiful harvest. When we, as senders and goers, when we pray to you, the Lord of the harvest. Yes, we count it an honor and privilege to be workers together with you knowing that when we go forth, we're spreading the message of our living Savior and seeing to it that that message goes forth into this dying world. And I thank you that as we give this day, according to what we have, as we purpose in our heart, doing so cheerfully that we will reap the corresponding manifold return on our giving in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And Father, we thank you for your healing power. You are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. We've called your covenant name early on. We set the atmosphere by inviting you and your ways into this place. And not just into this place, but where fellow believers listening are. So for those that have received their healing, the pain is gone. The heaviness has lifted. We shout hallelujah. We praise God with them. But we also continue to stand in faith with those that have yet to see the manifestation of what they prayed for. For if in fact they believed they received when we prayed, then they will have and we know this to be certain because when we pray according to your will, your word says this, we know we have the petitions we've asked of you. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Well, thank you, family, for joining us online. As always, our next Red Cross Blood Drive will be held Tuesday, March 8th from 9 a.m. in the youth act, uh, to 3 p.m. in the Youth Activity Center. Register today by downloading the Blood Donor app going to redcross.org or calling 1-800-RED-CROSS. And then you can purchase copies of the messages that you hear on Sundays and Tuesdays. That information is on the screen now. And our prayer line, that information also on the screen and can be found on our social media pages. So we look forward to seeing everyone this evening. We're going to continue our lesson on heaven and hell. Until then, continue to enjoy your day and continue to experience the best week of your life in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you that as we go forth or remain where we are, if your grace is upon us, you have given your angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways, protecting us from all hurt, harm, and danger, lest we dash our feet against stones because we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And I think that all satanic assignments set against us are canceled now. And that you have ready to minister for us, we who are the heirs of salvation, ministering spirits who heed the voice of your word. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. And we will see you tonight.